Uh, I think we'll meet, uh, wait another minute and uh, then we'll begin. Actually, um, people tend to join in slowly and uh, it's a very, uh, sometimes it tends to become a very intimate group, um, but we can still wait for a bit, I think. Okay, uh, I think um, it's time for us to probably start. Maybe more people will join us along the way and uh, it'll be uh, good to have more people uh, slowly and steadily as we progress in our um, presentation and conversation today. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to a uh, uh, brand new uh, <laughs> fresh out of the oven series, uh, new practices. And uh, this we have been in the talks and uh, been brewing or baking actually for a long time. And we wanted to hold something like this for, for a bit now. And as, yeah, we are back with the webinar, but you know, because of something that kind of remains from the past, from the past two years, some one takeaway would be the virtual world. We'll take away that forward a bit. And, um, uh, we are here today with Varunika, Saraf, and Zenith Nagri in conversation um, about the practice of Varunikas, uh, as well as uh, Nagri uh, and how um, Zenith interprets and talks about it and thinks about it. And um, so the whole idea of the series, I would like to speak a little bit about the um, new series and uh, particularly this conversation. The whole idea is simply to engage in a conversation and uh, more like, uh, you know, as I have kind of thought about it is in a way to think of this conversation and the series like of uh, like a river, how it flows and how one can sit at the banks and kind of enjoy the meandering conversations towards here and there, um, but still following that route of going forward and going wanting to touch um, different entities here and there, but yet moving forward and moving on. And uh, similarly, KNMA as an institution, as an institution uh, devoted and dedicated to the art, uh, um, wanted to kind of, you know, kind of hold the hands of the artists and be with them, you know, and not, and wanted to look at how uh, artists are basically looking. And personally, myself as a, as a, a uh, young art professional was keen to know and speak and hear young artists a lot. And I wanted something like this to come uh, to KNMA for a long time. Um, okay, without probably not taking much time, um, uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists, um, Varunika Saraf, Dr. Varunika Saraf and uh, Zenith Nagri. Um, we are very happy to have been pursuing Varunika and uh, Zenith for a while because I had, uh, I've been following Varunika for a bit and her work has totally enchanted me. I know uh, I used to go back to watercolors, although I'm not a trained artist, and just do something because of all the, not just the pandemic, but even before that, I used to go back to watercolor and her work I resonated with on so many levels in so many ways. And Zenith, again, I like how articulate she is, how beautifully. And I found that, you know, this kind of fit would really work for this webinar. Uh, introducing Dr. Varnika Saraf, um, she's an academic and artist based in Hyderabad. Uh, she's participated in various exhibitions in India and abroad. 
and uh, um, including many in uh, Heidelberg. A uh, lot of uh, she's received a lot of grants from IGNCA. And uh, recently, she has uh, held three solo shows, including the recently concluded Caput Mortem at Kemold Prescott, which I was like a fan and I wanted to see in Bombay, but unfortunately, I couldn't. Has received many prestigious grants and fellowships, such as Amul Badera Art Grant, Summer Research Fellowship at Getty Research Institute, Charles uh, Walls Trust, uh, India Trust Visiting Fellowship, Center for South Asian Studies, Cambridge, a uh, fellowship in the UK and visiting fellowship from Max Planck Institute. She also holds a PhD and an MPhil in art history from the School of Arts and Aesthetics, JNU and MFA in painting from uh, Essen School, uh, University of Hyderabad. She has actually, she will talk about her practice um, and I would also like to uh, you know, you'll go into how uh, uh, Varunika goes into her practice and it has so much detail. It has so much detail and I would love to I'm eagerly waiting to hear her. Um, but um, we would also love to introduce, uh, introduce and welcome uh, Zenith Nagri, who is an independent writer and curator living between Bombay and Montreal. She holds a master's in art history, theory and criticism from the School of the Art Institute, Chicago. Her art writing practice is built on an interesting and uh, interest in writing around art rather than writing about art. And currently, both of them are uh, displaying and curating right at this moment. I know Varika's work is showing in uh, uh, Nature Mode, and uh, Zenith is also curating something. And uh, we would love them to speak about these very very active artists and critics and uh, uh, and their practices and in conversation with each other basically exploring um, the world of each other you know in in the ways only a conversation can unfold uh, with that i would love to open the uh, uh, conversation between both of them please let me know uh, varunika and zinat whenever you want me to start the presentation I think we can start the presentation and maybe right. Barakha can uh, introduce it a little bit before we start, but yeah. Right. Yeah, so uh, the presentation sort of includes uh, works that are produced between uh, 2022 to 2006. I thought it was best to stop at 2006, otherwise this whole uh, presentation, this talk would become very autobiographical. And so we start with more um, recent works and then we go back in times uh, back in time, right back to 2006. And apart from that, we, uh, I will also be sharing some images of my of sort of my studio and uh, process as uh, well as some aspects of uh, my uh, research in miniature paintings or uh, this the so-called miniature paintings. So I think we can start with uh, the works first and sort of go to the other slides when the conversation turns to them. Yeah, I think we can just start the slideshow. Could we go on to the next slide? Yeah. Um, this work in the informal realm of our making was just recently uh, shown at Basel and it took me almost a year to make. Perhaps we can speak about it later. We could just, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with our practice, we could just go through the slideshow.
Yeah, if you could um, sort of uh, pause here and sort of um, open the conversation and then perhaps we can look at the other slides as, as we continue the conversation. Yeah, maybe we could just pause here. Thank you, Varunika, for sharing that uh, sort of rather concise selection of images, even if uh, we were all lost in the details, which we wanted to all see multiple slides of. And I mean, and that's the thing that uh, strikes, I think, everyone about your work is that there are so many layers and so many details. Uh, but also, I just want to sort of begin by noting that how we, our slideshow, your slideshow begins with um, a vision of hell. Yes. Right. Um, and in writing about the work, you've said that it's hell that is located in the here and now. And it is an infernal realm of our own making. True. And it's painted very much recently, right? In 2001, uh, uh, 21, 22. Um, but nevertheless, as we go through this slideshow, we reach um, all the way back to 2006, where uh, some of the titles might kind of already give away your interest, right? So you can't write poems about trees when the woods are full of policemen. That's uh, the title of one of the works in the last slide. And um, I wanted to talk to you, begin by actually uh, asking you about how it has been to work uh, with bringing in um, observations, um, and research about contemporary politics into your work and how that has been received by various kinds of stakeholders in the art world, uh, be it gallerists, be it audience members, be it critics over these years. Because I remember once in a conversation, you mentioned that people erroneously think that this is recent, but I want to understand how that has, you know, how would you map that sort of um, understanding? Yes, uh, like I mentioned uh, you know, in one of our conversations that a lot of people assume that uh, this sort of engagement with contemporary politics and sort of using history to understand our present is uh, quite recent in my work, but you know, it's actually a concern that goes back right to the beginning of my practice. And uh, I've, for me, I'm equally interested in sort of uh, contemporary art, but as well as history. And I think history becomes a very important tool and has been a very important tool for me to sort of understand our present circumstances and, you know, sort of uh, whether it's in terms of uh, what we're going through, but also use imagery from the past. Um, for instance, uh, the painting, uh, the infernal realm of our making, uh, sort of really refers to Botticelli's map of hell, which is based, with a, which is a visual interpretation of Dante's uh, canticle, first canticle uh, of divine comedy, right? But how do you use an image that talks about uh, the supernatural or the fantastical and support it to kind of talk about our present? Because uh, we don't, I often felt that uh, I don't have the visual language to talk about the horrors of our time. So a lot of times apocalyptic manuscripts become a very uh, important source to develop ways to speak about our present. Because it really what, what as an artist, where do you turn to? Right? You know what you want to speak, but how is it that you, you know, sort of speak it? I, uh, you, we, can't, we can't hear you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I had muted myself so there wouldn't be any noise. Um, so um, yeah, that's something that um, de definitely is um, sort of striking about when you are looking at the imagery that appears. So unlike, let's say, an image that may appear in a newspaper, which would be a direct documentary representation of a particular scene or a conflict or a situation of people, your work uses tools, as you said, from various other historical um, techniques developed in the past. And I'm wondering if we can just get into that, like get into talking about what kind of sources you actually uh, turn to. Actually, a lot of them. I think uh, that's where my training as an art historian also comes in. There's like a deep love for the past and for um, art making and visuals and really like anything and everywhere. I'm, 
right now I'm really sort of uh, very interested in, um, you know, the sort of what we uh, normatively call apocalyptic manuscripts from medieval Europe. Um, I have drawn extensively on this large body of work uh, that is produced in India, which we call miniature paintings. I have uh, drawn from paintings in Renaissance, but also a lot of imagery from contemporary sources as well. Uh, newspapers, images that we see on social media, images posted by friends, by activists. And I think uh, bringing it all together to speak about our time, you know, that's, that's been the most important concern about my work. Of course. And um, if I may ask you a little bit more about these apocalyptic manuscripts, so where do, uh, in your research, what have you found the impulses of itself, like making those manuscripts at that time? And um, what are the details that you look for or interest you within those, uh, those kind of, yeah, me? I think uh, the apocalyptic manuscripts which are produced in medieval Europe are very interesting because they were also produced at a time of great political strife, a time of plague, a time where people uh, did not understand how to process the phenomena that they were witnessing, right? It was, it was mm -hmm. a time of incredible change. And mm -hmm. I think uh, some of the imagery that uh, artists developed uh, is very, very fascinating. And one of the manuscripts that I've engaged extensively in the past couple of years is the Osberg Wonder Seichenberg or the Book of Miracles, which is uh, a manuscript from Bavaria and it was painted in the 16th century. So it has all these images of portents or signs that have appeared in the sky, which uh, could be a portent of a disaster or something good. And I've used it in the exhibition Cap at Mortem to talk about portents and to sort of ask the audience that these signs have been appearing in our own skies for a while. And uh, we need to collectively think whether these are signs of public concern or they're not signs of public concern. So this yeah. is how sort of past imagery can sort of be used to talk about the present. And uh, coming to miniature painting, uh, that is maybe uh, a territory that is that has many more associations and implications for your direct audience. Uh, sure. uh, given that uh, we do still have some, uh, at least some, uh, in our museums. Um, so I was wondering if we could uh, get into both, uh, you know, your research into the so-called miniature painting, as you've said, uh, as well as then it, the use of it uh, in, in your own work. Uh, so when I started uh, studying what we uh, normatively call as Indian miniatures, uh, it was back in 2007. And one of the things that was told to us that it's, it is, it's a broad term which is used to classify paintings that start off right from the 10th century um, to the 19th century. And one of the things that art history tells us is that miniature painting ended in the 19th century and company school of painting is perhaps the last phase of uh, you know this particular type of painting and after which it completely disappears. And for me, this was a very, um, this created a huge problem because you know I would go out and especially at fairs, I would see all these stalls and there were all these miniature paintings that were available. And the question that came to me was, well, if it's a dead tradition, but if art history is declaring it that it died in the 19th century, where are all these paintings coming from, you know? Um, what is the history of all these artists? At where are they trained? Uh, you know, what kind of an art world do they belong to? Because obviously, it is not an art world which is you know part of the gallery system or the education system as we know it. I learned the technique of miniature painting in my bachelor's, which itself is a little bit of an anomaly because you know if you look at most books on Indian art, you know um, it's just automatically assumed that since it was not taught in you know art colleges in Bang, uh, in, uh, sorry Baroda, Shantini Ketan, and Delhi that nobody learned it, but in it was a paper for two years in my uh, BFA training, mm -hmm. right, and this particular, so my PhD and my MPhil and my PhD research, they started off as an argument with art history. So what is this uh, term? What does it mean? Why do we call certain paintings miniature painting? If a painting is produced before the 19th century, why is it an example of fine arts, you know, uh, and, you know, why is it such a very hallowed piece of, you know, sort of 
artwork, which is to be preserved in a museum or an archive. And if it's produced after the 19th century, it suddenly becomes a handicraft, you know, and um, technically miniature paintings produced, uh, you know, currently are under the aegis of Ministry of Textiles. So it's, it's really strange. So if you have something which is an antique, it's with the Ministry of Culture. And if it's something which is produced right now, it's, it's not considered fine arts. It's placed under, you know, so all the policies that have been created by the government of India for the welfare of um, miniature painters are actually policies created by the Ministry of Textiles. Fascinating. Even though maybe there are works on paper, I yeah. imagine. Yes, so Ministry of Textiles have, has two directorates. So one is the Directorate of Handlooms and the other one is the director of, Directorate of Handicrafts. So all your woodwork, um, yes. all your paintings on paper, you know, leather crafts, everything falls under, um, you know, sort of, it broadly comes under the Ministry of Textiles. And to sort of uh, ask about this research a little further, we're all familiar with how we've seen in, even in our galleries, how um, Adivasi painters bring in contemporary themes, right? Uh, did you find that? I mean, I'm wondering how that conversation may have gone since in a way that you're using miniature painting and talking about the present, was that also a concern amongst the artisans and artists you encountered? Um, a lot of um, miniature painters choose not to show in art galleries because uh, you have to understand the world, art world of miniature painting as artists understand it and the art layers. It's a very complex world and this world has a value system in build. So it has modes of, you know, sort of production, a system of training, a system of circulation, and also a system which confers value on the painting. So they're more likely to sort of get more value for their work, you know, with their existing system of, uh, you know, production and sale of painting than they would in an art gallery. Right. But a lot of young uh, sort of practitioners um, do sort of uh, make the transition and they want to have a bit of both worlds. So a lot of them do train in bachelor uh, sort of for, they do go for training for their bachelor of fine arts and they are beginning to incorporate uh, sort of uh, use miniature painting and their training in miniature painting to uh, sort of talk about uh, their concerns. I see. OK. But the large chunk of like the art world, it has its own system in place and a lot of practitioners are com comfortable. Either they're stuck on it, stuck in it, or they're comfortable with it. So it depends on which position. So if it's a master craftsman, they would be very comfortable with it. But if it's somebody who's been hired by the master craftsman, they're kind of stuck in that world because that's what they need to do to make a living. Absolutely. And, uh... One of the, I mean, fascinating aspects of um, your research, which I read in this very short summary that appeared in Mark magazine in 2018, uh, was also this question of pigments, right? So um, the, uh, pigments is sort of very important to the nomenclature of miniature itself, but also how um, that became some kind of, uh, you know, object of almost value that was rare and um, how hierarchies got established because of access to pigments. And, um, and you talk about pigments also in your show in Kimol. So I was wondering if we could, you know, discuss these two things uh, together. I think um, this obsession with purity of tradition is something which art historians have managed to sort of pass on. Because actually, mm -hmm. if you meet artists and uh, once um, they kind of, uh, they understand that you yourself paint, uh, this whole... Uh, you know, sort of narrative of purity of tradition kind of falls away. I think a lot of time people are compelled to kind of, you know, sort of in a way play out a certain narrative that they think would give value to their work and which they think that art historians are very interested in learning. So they realize that art historians are not interested in the work, but are interested in them because of, you know, sort of what information that they might provide about mm -hmm the technique yeah. of say, Mughal painting or Dakhni painting or about their ancestors or many art historians have approached artists because they want to collect works, right? So they have this whole narrative about how it's a you know pure tradition which has been passed down from father to son for eons and eons and they've been you know uh, using the same colors. But actually, if 
you spend a lot of time. Yes, there are a lot of colors that are used like lapis and malachite, but um, nobody's going to stop using, you know, sort of a commercially available paint, you know, if it just speeds up the process, right? Yeah. Know, I don't think it is um, sort of uh, possible for artists to um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, kind of ignore the lure of colors, right? It's just not possible. And I'm sure even in the past, like, you know, if an artist in a Mughal atelier had access to kind of the colors that we do now, I don't think they would have gone like, no, this is what my father used and his father before him. So I'm just going to stick to these colors, right? It is, it's something which uh, this purity of traditions is something that art history is more obsessed with. And uh, sometimes I find younger practitioners, they have this sort of really huge anxiety, especially practitioners who are trained in art colleges. So they feel that if they are sort of um, incorporating miniature painting or the technique of miniature painting into their work, they themselves have to paint on a vasli, which is produced in Jaipur, burnish it in a particular way, um, process the pigments in a particular way. And if they diverge from like say the 15 colors or 20 colors that are used in a traditional miniature painting, it won't be a traditional miniature. Mm. And this is a very ridiculous idea because there is no such thing as a miniature painting to begin with. Like if you, you know, look at a painting which is produced in the 10th century to a painting which is produced in the 19th century, it's completely different, you know. Paintings in the 19th century, what we call as miniatures, weren't even painted on paper. Some of them were painted on mica and ivory. Yeah. There is, I mean, um, it's, a, it's a received term in a way, right? The miniature. Yes. And it um, also erases the fact that uh, Tradition is never stable. That's in the constant state of reinvention as well. That term itself raises that history and that fact um, and kind of um, makes us look at our past as some kind of block of uh, sort of themes, colors, sizes even, which is itself a kind of very, um, you know, because mi miniature and small. It, and then you were telling me about that term and I think it might be interesting for our... Um, listeners to hear about that. Traditions are always invented because uh, they're not so much to do with the past as they are to do with our present and how we would like to construct a narrative of a particular past to suit our present needs, right? Yeah. So in a sense, in that way, they're always invented. Um, and if you actually look at the word miniature, you know, it comes from minium, minium or red lead, which was extensively used in uh, sort of uh, European manuscripts and the same word was applied to Indian miniatures because when Europeans first encountered Indian painting, it was it looked so similar to the medieval manuscripts that were produced in Europe and the term just stuck in art history and it's, it's art history which has given us this completely ridiculous term and miniature doesn't have net anything to do with size or like some artists believe that miniature means, you know, sort of painting very minutely with minute bust strokes and then, you know, you're like, no, actually it doesn't mean that either. It's just a very broad term used to classify a broad range of paintings that were produced all over the subcontinent. You know, that's it. And it's time to sort of- Further out as well, like Turkey and Persia. Exactly, exactly. And it's, I think it's time to sort of move away from it and, you know, sort of be very specific. What exactly are you referring to? You know, are you inspired by paintings from the Mughal court or the Dakhni uh, sort of sultanates or, you know, the sort of small courts in Rajasthan or more popular painting? Because a lot of paintings that are even classified as miniatures are not even small. Like, how do you call something which is like two feet by two feet small, right? Or miniature. <laughs> That's not, yeah, for sure. And um, in your case, I mean, I was struck by how you spoke about the pigments in uh, your note for um, for Kemul, uh, which is that, uh, which you can get into, but also how maybe making your own pigments was out of necessity rather than sort of preserving some kind of so-called tradition. Yes, um, at, at one particular point of my um, sort of practice, I realized that I need lots of color because you know I'm, I was making paintings which are like eight feet, 12 feet, 10 feet. And it was not uh, viable to sort of depend on these 60 ml tubes because I would run through like 20 of those for just one single wash of color. And um, I was very lucky. I happened to be in Florence on a fellowship and we were taken to sort of this con 
conservation lab. And that's where I discovered, hey, wait a minute, there are all these pure pigments that are available, which are made for specialists who conserve paintings. And I could use this to make my own watercolors. And that's where this obsession with, you know, sort of making my watercolor, you know, my own watercolor started. Of course, it helps that the process itself is kind of really beautiful. And yeah, so it's a little bit of both. It's, it's, it's a little bit like something that your four-year-old self wanted to do but could never do. And now you can just legitimately do it as a part of your practice and a little bit out of necessity, necessity as well. Yeah. I mean, it's a very interesting um, question that you raised and which I've discussed with other artists in the past also, which is um, maybe slightly like provocative, but um, how sort of um, the pleasure of making intersects with um, working on rather difficult subject matter, working on, um, uh, you know, questions and information related to oftentimes tragedies of others. And, um, and how, how do you sort of balance that as an artist? I think it, it gets a little bit balanced because um, you don't kind of do the both together. So you have like specific days for just making color and stocking up. And then there would be days where you would be sort of um, thinking about more difficult questions um, and also largely also about why are you painting in the first place and how should you be painting it as a try to paint certain things. And also questioning the act of making art in today's time as well, right? It seems an extremely privileged activity, but you know, uh, thinking about why, how you know, should you do that? Um, so getting to that question of research and how you choose, um, you know, what you, what you want to paint, I was wondering what your approach is to, um, to how you collect material, how you think about uh, representations, so particularly depiction of identifiable individuals versus archetypes, and uh, that might represent uh, certain conditions that are present around us, and how you sort of then um, also, uh, how much time you spend doing all of that, how, how that comes into the work? Yeah, I think because of my training um, as an art historian and a researcher, I spend a lot of time researching. So I usually uh, sort of start off with what is it that I want to say? And it's not very different uh, from what I would actually speak about or what I would write about, right? I paint about things which are of, you know, of immediate concern to me and those of, uh, who form a very close circle of friends as well. And uh, there is a lot of research in terms of color. There's a lot of research in terms of what, how best to represent it. Why should I represent it? Am I crossing any ethical boundaries when I represent it? Um, if I'm using sort of images from the past, like I did for um, sort of uh, uh, the map of hell, which was based on uh, Botticelli's work that itself requires like a deep dive into the archives and you know sort of looking at uh, sort of museum collections and li library collections and sort of finding images that I would require to sort of uh, you know do justice to that particular idea that I have. Um, so I want to ask one more thing that I asked in the previous question maybe it got lost but how, how do you think about um, identity for example in your and representation of ident identifiable individuals. So for example, in the show that you put up at uh, Kimo Prescott Road in Mumbai, um, there were certain figures with uh, halos around them, sort of like icons, you might say, who uh, to me um, referenced, for example, the women we saw in sit-ins um, yeah. in, in various parts of the country, particularly Delhi, uh, where you also live. Um, so I was wondering how you approach that question of identifying actually people. Um, though those are based on sort of reference from images that were taken by photographers and friends and activists. Um, I do make a lot of effort to alter the face, right? And there are certain images that uh, I don't think one should ever represent, especially if that, you know, representing that image is going to bring pain to somebody. In the series, Jugni, it didn't create a problem because Jugni is also a celebration, celebration of rebels, you know, sort of women 
um, who are sort of active agents of political and social change, but uh, sort of in other works such as Caput Mortem or Miasma, that was a very uh, thin ethical line. And I made sure that I did not um, sort of represent a particular person, mm -hmm. an identifiable particular person, because uh, those are images of violence being inflicted on people. And I think by representing their faces, I do not want to cause more trauma to them. So I would often sort of, um, sort of look at a lot of images and sort of um, come up with, uh, it's the same images of violence that were repeated again and again, and you would find the same kind of feelings and the same kind of acts being repeated again and again. So kind of identifying those and then portraying those. I see. And um, I know that we are, uh, you know, stuck with the kind of art world system that we are in, in you know, in India, but, um, but so unfortunately, sometimes the only place for these kind of works is, is a gallery where things are objects are also for sale, right? And, and that is also the way the artists make a living. And that's a very real, you know, surviving part of life. So, um, I mean, what are your imaginations for maybe, how would you like to show your work, let's say, were it not for this system? Or how would you imagine the place would be for this, this work? Well, I did try alternative ways of showing work and uh, that came with its own set of problems. For a while, um, I would only paint posters on campus and um, yeah. I realized that most people didn't like my posters because um, they wanted a very German expressionist language and my lines were very too thin and too weak and I would constantly be told by friends, no, that woman looks too thin and scrawny to lead a revolution, you know, just put more muscles on her, you know. Uh, so yes, you know, alternative spaces also come with its own set of problems. And the main problem that I faced was uh, this uh, sort of hierarchy between the written text and the image. And it was what mm -hmm. is you that uh, people who write are somehow uh, much more uh, in tune with sort of uh, political ideas and, you know, they have more right to sort of speak than artists and artists should just, you know, follow what people write you know so it's it's a very old trope where art has to follow literature and unfortunately we are still stuck with it so um i don't know the ideal solution i think um having an approach which where you do whatever you can in whichever space you can so if somebody says okay let's you know let's make posters i would just do that if somebody said oh you know this is this publication coming uh, out you know do you want to illustrate it or you know sort of make you know, the book cover, I would say yes. Or, you know, if there is a collab possibility of collaboration that comes up, I think one has to do multiple things, you know, especially if um, you have certain ways of looking at the art world. But yes, you know, one does have to sustain your practice and it's something which kind of strikes you more as you grow older. Yeah. Interesting that you should say that uh, in these spaces, the alternate spaces that you spoke about, the written word was um, somehow um, uh, superior in this hierarchy that was, or this dynamic or binary that was set up. Uh, because one gets the impression in the art world that sometimes, uh, um, especially within the gallery system, that the written word only serves for sales. Um, this is kind of a cynicism that I sometimes have about it. But again, you do what you want to do. You try to experiment within the field. So I relate with that. I understand that. Um, um, another question that uh, I've had, and then maybe we can either open up. I realize the time has just sort of passed by. <laughs> um, is uh, maybe we can look at the images that you uh, had in the presentation, perhaps quickly, because I think we spoke about the topics. But in case uh, we we just want to run through them, and then maybe one or two questions to wrap up. So uh, Neha, if we can have that uh, presentation back up. So just um, yeah. Just whatever question comes up, just ask me how to pause and then, you know, we can yeah. pick up from, because I think we did run through the presentation without giving people any context. And it, yeah. was, it was okay then because we were also waiting for people to join in. But I guess for those who are unfamiliar with the work, it might have seemed like a very odd thing to do, to have the silent mm -hmm. presentation. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah. We'll from the beginning, I think. I love this. If we can stop here also yeah. as a portrait, it is uh, incredible because you see two faces, right? And one, uh, and if you could talk about that, you know, uh, the contemporary and the past kind of like layered. Um. This uh, particular, the image that this painting is referencing to is, is particularly very special to me because it also tied up with it is also the history of my practice. So when I was 13, uh, I was given two books. One was uh, Stuart Carey Wells' Indian Art and Culture, and the other book was Pratabha Tityapal's Pastor Artists of the Imperial Mughal Court. And in the pages of both these books was this portrait of uh, a dying Mughal courtier, Inayat Khan, who's uh, dying of uh, opium addiction. And when Jahangir realizes that his courtier is dying of opium addiction, he's so moved by him eh, because he can't imagine that any child of God could be reduced to the state and he immediately gets his artist to um, sort of, um, you know, make a drawing and also a painting of it. So this actually, this portrait uh, shows, um, you know, it references that image. And uh, for me as a 13 year old, that, you know, sort of, there was this morbid curiosity because at once I was really drawn to the beauty of the painting, but also kind of really sort of shaken by the horror of what it represented. And as I grow old, grew older, and um, it's, just, it's a painting that I've come back to constantly because it's also really beautiful as a drawing. So I always, it, I use it as sort of a yardstick to judge my own uh, sort of capability. And in a way, also it's a bit of a subversion because um, you have all these depictions of men suffering in the past. And to kind of take an image of that, to kind of talk about myself or woman seemed kind of fun thing to do. I think at some point, what I'm really trying to do is to get myself excommunicated from the church of art history. <laughs> and um, you, you sort of um, then get a very interesting sort of layered uh, self-portrait, which uh, has this anecdote wrapped into it, of course, if one knows about it, but even by itself, uh, one, one, and even if one is not familiar with that painting that you mentioned, um, one can get a sense of uh, these tensions that are present in the image, right? Between the male and the female artist figure, between the past and the present, between a sort of, um, uh, a mode of dressing that is more contemporary, but nevertheless references even in textile, the kind of robes that uh, these individuals uh, would wear in, 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 in depictions of miniature paintings. So, or, or what we call miniature paintings. And the you setting- can't, You can't keep a Hetrabadi away from the cuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we could perhaps move on to the next slide, um, which is, yeah. Uh, so which was the work, yeah. No, no, sorry, I, I shouldn't have interrupted you. No, no, go on. So this is a painting which is based on uh, Botticelli's uh, sort of visual interpretation of Dante's uh, poem, Divine Comedy. And instead of sort of looking at you know various levels as in sort of levels which are levels of hell, which, you know, sort of lead, uh, you know, uh, Dante and his companion right to the devil, um, you know, kind of subverted that whole space to talk about like say, predation of natural resources, climate change, biological disasters, and you know, sort of increasing political strife and war. So instead of um, sort of becoming an abysmal valley of uh, pain, which one is subjected to as a consequence of wrongdoing in an afterlife, uh, the map becomes a sort of a space to talk about our present and a society that sort of uh, you know rewards wrongdoers. Hmm. And then details. I, I, I wish I had more details to show you because it has all these like little sort of art historical references and also little sort of um, even sort of jokes in it, you know. But mm. it's it's the problem with such large works and sort of you know shrinking them down to size for or sort of you know the internet and computers. It's it just everything gets lost in it. <laughs> yeah. 
There could we nevertheless pull up the details that are there in the previous slide? So if we could go to the next slide. Two more details. The next slide, the next two slides have a little bit of details. Maybe you could just go on to the next uh, couple of slides and see if show some of the details. Um, I wanted to stop, pause the slideshow to bring up a question that came in the chat box. So I think we can take them as and when they come. Yeah. Uh, by uh, Mayank. Um, he asks, how does one not give in to engaging in or furthering propaganda while exploring political concepts in one's artwork? Or is it inevitable when one explores such topics in the artwork? Um, I would probably assume that my work is countering propaganda. You know, I don't think it's kind of adding to propaganda because what is the propaganda today? The propaganda is everything is all right. Uh, we are on the steady part of progress. Uh, you know, you know, the GDP is great. Everything is great, but that's not the truth of what I see around me, right? So um, I don't think a sort of, uh, it's inevitable. I don't know if that makes sense. I understand. Um, and also this, the fact that um, you, uh, you see certain kinds of images circulating yes. in the newspapers, but there is a whole other realm of images circulating on WhatsApp and, you know, uh, particularly uh, YouTube and these kind of um, images that are manufactured for, um, to counterfact in a different way, right? Through propaganda. So, uh, so there is, there are multiple layers of, uh, in you know, discourses of images that we have currently in our country. Um, let me put it this way: if if one calls secularism propaganda, if one calls feminism propaganda, or um, hoping for a truly equal society without the divisions of religion and caste as propaganda, then I guess one could say that my work is propaganda. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm uh, curious if there are any um, sort of art historical references because that's also something that uh, um, was it shown interest in the, within this detail that you could point us to or talk about. There's only one in this because I think a lot of um, uh, a lot of them were on the top of the painting, but here you can see a man holding up uh, his own head, and that is from a, a drawing by Stradinus. And I think it's it's a very small one right on the bottom right side of the painting. You can just see a man holding up the head, his own head. And I think mm -hmm. that's very symbolic of what we're doing as a society. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, the non-trained eye or even me for <laughs> that matter would miss that. So it's also, it's also important, I guess, when you do work like this to use uh, references in symbols that hold up on their own without uh, even needing to go back to that painting. So multiple and readings are possible. I really urge people to sort of walk into galleries and see art, you know, in person, because especially with artists who work on a large scale, a lot of it just disappears on the computer screen. If, if this painting was in front of us, it, it would be a completely different story. Of course, yeah. Um, could we move on to the next slide, please? So these are images, uh, the display images. I thought it would be interesting to sort of, uh, you know, put in a few images of the display because that's when you understand the scale of the work. And uh, this is from a recently concluded show at Kemal Prescott Road, which I titled Caput Morton. Could you uh, maybe tell us about the title? Uh, so the, this body of work takes its name from the synthetic iron oxide pigment caput mortem or dead head that resembles dried blood. In alchemy, caput mortem is classified as worthless remains, the residue that uh, is left on the bottom of the heating flask once all the nobler elements sublimate. 
And I thought, you know, it was very interesting as a pigment because it is symbolic of our society, an outcome of a flawed experiment. It's a metaphor of decay and decline. And I thought it was a perfect uh, sort of pigment that could be used to highlight uh, a lot of what we say, um, leave unspoken in our complicity. Uh, so this pigment was used in the underlayers of all the paintings on the show. So it was deposited in thin washes onto the burnished place plane of the Vasli. And it was done in such a way that it hemorrhages through the overlying layers, um, you know, just enough to stain the surface, you know. So it's almost like historical injustices have seeped through the cracks of time to mold our present. It becomes like a wound that has been inflicted on society. The color actually looks like dried blood, you know. So it, it's, it, for me, it became a perfect metaphor to talk about, you know, today's time. We could go on to the next slide. And you see that, uh, that uh, what, what the hemorrhaging as you described it in this, yes. in this picture as well. Yes, uh, so this, this painting is actually built about, with about five to six layers of different colors. So what you see is blue is actually not blue, it's brown, then you know, a lot of cerulean blue, Persian blue, a couple of purples, and then the final ultramarine. Um, I, I think uh, a lot of time a single color is not enough to you know, sort of portray feelings, right? Um, especially feelings which are indescribable. So in this, you know, by sort of having this complexity of layers, it kind of gives the painting more meaning. I think it's like Rothko. When you first look at a Rothko, you don't, uh, you immediately look, you don't look at the strokes. You don't look at the, you know, in, you don't think about the individual colors. What you're struck by is just an indescribable feeling, right? So I, I try to sort of use the same um, sort of technique to kind of build, you know, sort of, feelings into my works and have the sort of caput mortem pigment sort of bleed through it. Can we go on to the next slide please? Yeah, so the next one is a detail of this work and I think this could be classified depending on how you look at the world as a propaganda piece. <laughs> Celebration. Celebration. I hope um, uh, all of you noticed the little skeleton in the previous slide, which is sort of doing the rounds of the landscape. So this oh, yeah. at the very top. At the top, you know, there's a skeleton with a flaming sword. Yeah, it's a little hard to see in the presentation, I would say. Should we go on to the next one? Yeah. Um, there is, of course, um, something that one identifies immediately as um, India or maybe South Asia um, with the kind of objects and postures that you attribute to, to your characters. And I just wanted to make note of that. It's not necessarily a question, but more of a comment that, uh, that within, um, I imagine, for a foreign audience, it would uh, be identifiable as well. I would hope so, because I think this, this work is very specifically about South Asia. Makes me think of all the water cannons and um, yeah, that we even spoke about um, in the past in relation to JNU. Mm -hmm. This work was based on sort of what everything that unfolded in uh, sort of early, late winter in Delhi in 2019. And that's why it's called a train this winter. And a lot of uh, people who know, live in Delhi are probably familiar with how bleak it becomes when it rains in winter. 
kind of sort of talking about that. Okay. Should we move on to the next slide? Uh, I think, yeah, we can see details better in this one. Yeah, and these are also smaller works. So in the previous slide, you can see them sort of mounted on the wall on the left side. So sort of those little grids of color. So these are the same works. Well, eight of them. The police, um, policeman or the police force uh, are, uh, were really was really a, a figure that was present yes. quite widely in uh, in this show in this exhibition at Kemal in particular. Um, I think all of us are very familiar with these images. You know, these are images that have been appearing um, in newspapers. You know, not just on social media. You know, over the last four or five years, and um, the amount the, the exponential rise of violence is definitely something that we have been witnessing more and more in the recent times. I think this work is about the miasma of violence. Miasma is sort of a bad air. And I think, you know, we are suffering from this. We go on to the next slide. Yeah, this was the work that we referenced in relation to yes. the, the halos, the icons, the celebration of uh, so it, it's poof, I don't know if you're familiar with Russian icons of the Madonna and some of them are not just profusely um, painted with gold, but also have a lot of embroidery done with sort of pearls and sort of other sort of precious metal threads. So I wanted to use the language of veneration, but kind of not talk about a divine um, sort of person, but to talk about real women who are sort of fighting for their rights you know, and women as sort of active agents of political and social change because women do hold up you know more than their share of half the sky you can go on to the next slide so i wanted to actually ask you about this project because it seems uh to span the breadth of uh, the independent Yes. Nation of India and uh, references very specific uh, moments yes. in yes. the history. And so, could you tell us uh, is this an ongoing project? How are you sort of how are you conceptualized? So, it is an ongoing project, and I think uh, in its final version, it's going to be displayed at the Shaja Benale next year. So, We the People um, is a series of 75 embroideries, and each embroidery represents one year since independence. And uh, the way the map has been made is by using uh, the dye cochineal extracted from the cochineal insect. So it's literally, it becomes symbolic of the blood that has been spilt in the making of the nation. And onto each map is embroidered one specific image from a year. So whether it's the Chashnala mining disaster or the Chipko movement or floods or um, you know, sort of other events that have come to pass and events which we uh, didn't pay enough attention to because I always think that um, if we had paid attention to those events, would we be in the present uh, situation that we find ourselves in? And this work is inspired by Eduardo Galliano, who kind of um, suggests that we go looking for uh, the keys in the past to understand our present. So it's, this work was actually made as a personal sort of way to understand why is it certain things are happening. And one can almost imagine this, even the scans of these works almost as a history book, right? So yes. each image having its own page, sort of speaking about a year in a way. But um, a lot of images that have been depicted are sort of things that we tend to also ignore in our history books. Exactly. So an what I meant is an alternate sort of uh, timeline of the nation state. And yeah. the last map in the series, so there's 75 plus one. So the last map is left empty because I feel that uh, thinking about um, the present through the past must be a collective activity, you know. So it's for each of us to kind of 
think about our collective history and to think about moments of our past which have led to this present moment. So in a way, it's not a definitive history. It's for all of us to think about it. It's just like sort of a prompt to people to say, to say, think about what has gone wrong in our past. Have we always been a very equal society to begin with? Um, these ones I was quite fascinated by because uh, to me, in my reading of it in, on first glance, it, it seemed to be uh, somewhat self-portraits or portraits you know, in a way, or, or, but, but not only in, in a sense, um, they, they brought for me the exhibition to a personal realm that wasn't necessarily the focus necessarily of the rest, rest of the exhibition. And um, I wonder uh, if you could speak about that and in terms of also uh, sometimes that working with, um, Questions of politics do take a toll as well. Um, they do. And I think that was the reason why I kind of left them in the show because at one point I debated, you know, do they even belong with the rest of the body of the work, right? Because these are more, as you pointed out, these are more uh, sort of inward looking works. But uh, then sort of a lot of times uh, the boundaries between like what, what exactly is personal, what exactly is intimate is so blurred in today's time and we sort of really impacted by what is uh, sort of happening around us. I thought I should let this be. And these paintings were sort of um, a response to Nina Simone's song, Mood Indigo, where she sings, uh, you ain't been blue till you've been Mood Indigo. But of course, for a completely different set of reasons. <laughs> And now we're sort of jumping back into the past uh, with this work. So this, this work was actually made in 2016. And again, it's um, a reference to Brett's quote, who I use, who comes up you know, a lot in my work. So the central image is screen and the painting screen. And then around it are sort of uh, this labyrinth. And the labyrinth actually is not referencing to the city, but actually to the nation. And actually, if you look closely, there are events in this. It maps every single sort of act of violence which have been sort of perpetuated in this country since 1947 to the present. With sort of uh, the name of the place and the date. So it's for us to sort of kind of look at it and, you know, sort of look it up and see what happened on that date. It just gives the name of the place and the date underneath every image. So in a way, it also um, shares the impulses with the project we saw with the maps. Uh, exactly. But does it quite differently in that um, there's a seriality and a sort of um, maybe the repetition in the maps allows maybe a, a different kind of comprehension, whereas here, um, there seems to be also an intentional claustrophobia that's created yes. uh, in the image, right? Because this one specifically maps instances of violence or, you know, what people call riots. Yeah, and that term itself is... Um, yes. <laughs> ...to be questioned and questioned. Yes, and I think it's, it's a term that we really sort of need to unpack, you know, and it... It's a, it's a very problematic term, but you know, it's just when I say right, it's just quote unquote right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, what do we have at the center of this image? Uh, although we cannot quite see it, uh, I, I was piqued my curiosity and it's, you might be able to tell us. It's the painting screen. Okay. Now, now that you say it, I can, I can see it. <laughs> it's, just, it's just really small. Yeah. Um, okay, I think just there. Zoom is being attempted. Oh, yeah, you can actually. See. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. Okay. It's just like, you know, sort of monk scream is something which kind of has resonance across time. And, you know, it's, it's exactly and how you, what you feel. You know, I think he, he does get his, you know, sort of his finger on the pulse. Yeah. 
and, and also the assurance staircase is kind of leaked to yes. a sort of absurdity, yes. right? Yes. Uh, yes. Absurdity that we're stuck in. And also to uh, because both of uh, the assurance staircase and monk's cream were roughly around the same period, but they kind of represent two very different aspects of the art world at that time, you know, I showed like very scientific, systematic, and this is more about feelings and it seemed like a very interesting thing to kind of mash them together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, it goes back to my impulse of being, you know, sort of uh, my sort of desire to get excommunicated one of these days. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, yeah. I feel we could do a presentation just with details sometimes because yeah. we got uh, Anyway, we can go on to the next image. And here there are like little moments if you sort of train your eye to look a little bit. We have one of the details in the following slide, but there are others as well. I think that detail is going to come up in the next slide. Yeah. So the entire painting is sort of little with all these details. So when you actually look at it, you see this really beautiful forest, um, which is reminiscent of sort of Han scenes from paintings of Kota in the 18th century. But actually, if you look very closely, the entire forest is filled with really brutal acts of violence. And I think that was very um, symbolic of what we were seeing unfold in sort of um, you know, parts of Central Asia, a uh, sort of Central uh, Central India. I mean, there are just so many. If you look, uh, although it seems like, uh, yeah much like a forest that sort of um, reveals itself the more you train your eye. Exactly. Look at it. That's the detail from the previous one. It's a very tongue-in-cheek work from 2010 and sort of this obsession with um, the chair in uh, South Asian politics. Mm. Again, I think if you zoom in, you will see a lot of uh, detail. Maybe we could just take a second to do that. So each um... each blot is actually a sort of um, a political figure, right? But not a specific political figure. It just references to the language that you see, you know, sort of political figures employ. Right, some very familiar modes of dressing and gestures mm -hmm. and uh, postures as well. We could go on to the next slide, please. I think, I, I don't know if you can see it, there's a woman trying to do yoga in a rocking boat where somebody is sitting on the shores singing ragas. And I think that's a little bit of what, uh, what I feel when people say that they are apolitical, because I don't know what that means. I think being apolitical is also extremely political. It does feel like doing yoga in a very rocky boat. With yoga itself having its own history of uh, <laughs> circulating to the West and coming back, much like the miniature, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, the futility of like sort of, you know, taking care of your health and your, you know, sort of mental well being, you know, when everything around you is just not in your control. You could go on to the next slide, please. Could you, since we have better details of this one uh, or a close-up of this one, tell us about the art historical references and in the previous slide, please. 
Um, yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, to a Mughal painting, which actually shows, uh, which depicts a tail, which I think the Mughals found really absurd and fascinating. So it shows a Chinese princess being drowned by one of the princes of Baghdad. So he gets so infatuated with her that he's not able to um, sort of uh, pay attention to the administrative affairs of his states. And then he decides to throw the woman that he loves into the Tigris. And the Mughals couldn't believe that somebody could uh, do something as absurd as this. So they had an image painted of this particular scene and I decided to kind of spoof it to kind of talk about how, you know, in South Asia, women tend to drown every day, you know, so it's each day you drown a little bit. Is it made on a textile, this one? This one is made on a textile. So the textile has been overlaid with paper. So you can see uh, the textile from um, you know, sort of underneath the paper. You okay. absolutely can guess. It's, it's, I tend to sort of layer works with sort of textile and then paper and then textile and then more paper. Yeah, we saw that in a few works as well, including Mood Indigo. Yeah. Yes, and also like the island, the pink color work that just went by, that's also like a textile print, ah. which then I yeah. used to sort of, to sort of, you know, create painting or work. I think we'll reach the final slide after this, uh, the next one of images of the world. I think these are the two oldest works that I've included for this presentation. And, and this one is on Vasli, which we mentioned and discussed. Uh, I created my own Vasli and it's something that I've been doing since 2001. I do not buy ready-made Vasli, I think. It's, it's important for me to sort of control every layer of the work and, you know, making my own Vasli allows me to do that. Could you tell us about the process for like non... So a lot of people assume that Vasli is just paper that you buy in Sanganer, which comes readily immediately available, but actually Vasli is creating a, you know, thick surface for the painting, which is, you know, stable and absorbent. And you can make a Vasli from practically any paper. Basically, it means that you have to bind together different layers of paper and burnish them so that they create a final surface, which is thick and absorbent. How do you burnish it? Sorry. <laughs> so you get a sort of agate stones with which you burnish them. Okay. I guess then that's a perfect time to transition into the studio, which I think are the next few slides or one, at least one slide after this. Yeah. This is my studio space. I've uh, moved into this current space in 2018. And we see unfinished, uh, uh, an and unfinished you photo. Can, of, you, can, you can see the infernal realm of our making right at the back. So these are sort of process images of uh, we the people. So that's uh, the cochineal insect on top and then, you know, sort of, uh, how it looks when you boil it and then how you strain it and then how it's used to sort of um, tie and dye and then sort of the embroidery stages of the work. So the map that you see is actually tie and dye, basically. Yes. But instead of dipping the whole textile into a vat of dye, which is normally what you would do, I very carefully sort of only dyed the areas which were tied. Right. So the first two slides are of, uh, you know, sort of my preparation of verdigris, where you sort of treat copper with acetic acid, and then you get this beautiful green color and you let the liquid evaporate and then it forms these crystals. And then what you have to do is sort of take those crystals and grind them. And the um, other sort of images uh, are of uh, sort of uh, pigments that are available from uh, you know, shops that specialize, um, who cater to conservationists. These are some slides from my MPhil and my PhD research. And uh, your research was primarily carried out in Rajasthan, I believe. Uh, Rajasthan and Himachal Pradesh. Okay. The, the field work part of it, the archival work part of it was like all over the place. Of course, yeah, yeah, I meant the field work as well. Yes, um, field was, uh, mostly in Chamba and Kangra in Himachal, and then um, Kishangad, uh, Jaipur, Udaipur, Samod, uh, Ranthambore uh, in Ra Udaipur, and Nadwara in uh, Rajasthan. Uh, 
Um, could, could, we, could we stay on the next slide, please? Yeah, um, so I urge people to, you know, find a copy of that article and read it because it's also fascinating of, uh, you know, the things that you point out and in, in the, um, uh, you know, insight that it leads to, which is that also copying um, was a big part of, uh, and, and you can talk about it and explain that to, to, the, to our listeners. Um, and, and copying itself, to me, is a very... Um, contemporary thing, right? Like, and you see it completely all around you in conceptual art practices. And um, it's an assertion of um, a play, a kind of postmodern play in, or it's read as such in, in various other, um, and, and perhaps the difference is the intent, but even then, I think that um, one must make room for the fact that uh, you know, the way in which we uh, analyze something as inventive, even when it re involves reproductions in a Western context or in a gallery context versus non-inventive when it is in a so-called handicraft context. Um, um, I think uh, copying processes have always been a part of training in an atelier, right? How do you learn? You learn by sort of copying works that have been already created. And it's a very, very crucial way in which sort of techniques and motives and uh, you know processes have been transferred from um, the teacher to the student um, but in the case of the world of contemporary nature painting um, copies have also been made with specific intent and I think that's a very interesting uh, thing to explore and I urge everybody who wants to sort of who is interested in this to just sort of reach out to me over Instagram, I would be more than happy to share um, the Mark article, which contains some of my research. Okay. Um, we could move on to the next slide, I think, yeah. So, um, so I put together this particular slide, which shows sort of um, quote unquote miniature painters from the 20th to the uh, 19th to the 20th century. So uh, if miniature painting died in the 19th century, then how do we have so many images of artists, right? And uh, these are right from like the late 19th century to say 1950s, 1960s. And anonymity is also a very interesting thing, right? Like one wonders why we associate miniature painting with anonymous artists so much. Is it, and it, it is, in, in the popular imagination, I mean, uh, yeah. and it is because of lack of interest in research in the first place, right? And, Even uh, we're talking about before nineteenth century. And, and this, this is a really, really important point because I think it goes right back to Kumar Swami. And when Kumar Swami sort of tried to make this distinction between the materiality of the West and the spirituality of the East, one of the things that he said, like, oh, Indian artists, you know, sort of they like to be anonymous and they, you know, sort of work for the higher sort of, uh, you know, principles. And I think that's done a great disservice to Indian art because even when we had names of artists, you know, whether they are uh, sort of painters or sculptors, we kind of chose not to look at it because it just, you know, for a very long time in art history, it kind of fit into this narrative that, oh, you know, East is different from the West and, you know, we, we are more about, you know, spirituality than, you know, sort of individual recognition. But actually, if you go digging, you know, there's a lot of places and I think a lot of people are doing interesting work, you know, excavating names of archives. I think Deepi Kira is one of them. Her recent book is something that I urge all of you to pick up. I think one of the reasons why uh, field work was also very productive was uh, at first I wouldn't tell artists that I could paint and uh, you know the conversations were somehow very very superficial and because I thought they would judge me if I told them I painted but actually to my surprise the kind of welcome that I received when I told people that I paint and I could show them some of what I painted it was really beautiful because I always thought they would, you know, say that, okay, you know, she has an access to, she's trained in an art college, she has access to a different world, so there would be a lot of hostility. But to my surprise, it wasn't like that at all. And there was a lot of love and welcome. And there were moments where I even got to practice together with artists. And one of my most memorable moments in my sort of field work was at the Atelier of 
the artist Mahavi Swami in Bikaner. So these are, you know, and I'm glad you insisted that I include pictures from my research because um, I went digging sort of through my folders and I found these images that I'd almost forgotten about. Yeah, these were not in the mark. Yeah. yeah. Um, we could, uh, yeah, run through the next few slides. Uh, so these are quote and quote master craftsmen because the government classifies them as master craftsmen, but these are some of the most incredible artists that I had the pleasure of meeting in the course of my research. And you also, I mean, uh, the caption on the, sorry, the previous one talks about the art dealers at Chitanand, yeah. but also the art dealers have played a huge part in, uh, in this. Um, so I mean, it's almost like, without getting too much into the detail, it's almost like the same story all the time, right? Like you may want to separate commerce and this kind of, again, a pure realm of art, but then you can't. it always, it's always, uh, you know, orbits that intersect and uh, inform each other in some ways as well, right? Out of necessity, yeah. out of uh, desire to collect and so on and so forth. I think um, a lot of our young artists in this art world, you know, sort of begin their careers in atelieres like this. It's only when they get an award that they're able to break free of it and because they get access to a completely different uh, set of networks and market. And what's lovely about this image is Sotheby's. <laughs> yes, uh, you would actually, uh, some of the atelieres have the best collections of books that are to be found on Indian art. You would be surprised, you know, how updated the collection is. Mm -hmm. Sort of, yeah, the quantum of that image. Um, and here we see larger, quote unquote, miniature. Uh, so these are pitch wise, and uh, a lot of artists who paint uh, sort of uh, painting something. Restoration. Uh, restore and also create pitch wise as well, because uh, though pitch wise are on cloth and, you know, sort of. So miniature paintings are on paper. Uh, a lot of pigments are the same. A lot of imagery is the same. Uh, you know, the way you would apply layers of color is also the same. So you find them working across sort of sizes and mediums. Medium is as in terms of the base, you know, whether it's paper or cloth. Uh, yeah. I think we can log, I, it's been an hour and a half since we've been talking. So uh, thank you everyone for your patience. I don't know if anyone has any more questions. We've taken them as we've gone along through the presentation. Um, I think this is uh, maybe a nice moment to perhaps uh, suspend our conversation. I wouldn't say end. Uh, and um, I would like to thank you so much for the generosity of the material that you've shared and uh, also the insights. And to NMA for inviting me, of course. Yeah. I'm very happy that you agreed. And I was um, I was really hoping that you would say yes. And I really want to also take a moment to thank Neha for being so lovely and being so persistent and uh, for putting up with all my sort of scheduling uh, crisis and being so kind about it. So thank you, Neha. Thank you, Madhurama. And thank you, the whole team. I think Anil for helping us today with you know putting together the whole slideshow and live streaming it as well. Mm -hmm. I think, Arneha, without your generosity and your, your sort of kindness, I don't think this conversation would have taken place. And it's it's very interesting. I really enjoyed today's conversation and also con con conversations leading up to today as well. And I think I really hope these don't end here and we sort of continue, you know, perhaps in different forums as well. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I'm so happy and we were just wondering, you know, and um, my colleague and uh, I that, you know, this is something so enriching. I mean, I would I was so keen to know about your work. And this is just uh, baffling because I was listening to it so keenly looking at the slides and uh, so many things. I have a question myself, like uh, there is not a question, actually a comment, because what I relate to it on a lot of levels is the you know, beautiful performative angle that you bring in the uh, in your style of miniatures so to call them for the lack of an um, 
very deep art historical or a very conventional art historical term. Um, uh, and I, I like that uh, the whole body language is so true to times and uh, um, it just takes on a different um, layer and a uh, lot of uh, beautiful meanings are brought forward, which might be comfortable as well as uncomfortable. And yet, um, and, and a lot of, uh, a lot of allegory in terms of how you bring for, forth the uh, whole storytelling and the figurative. Uh, in fact, at the museum also, we have recently had uh, the post-pandemic um, exhibitions have been all about uh, the figurative and, uh, I, I, and I love, and, and it's very refreshing actually to see your work, Varunika. And uh, even more refreshing is to hear you speak about it and Zenith. Um, you know how beautifully you have steered through the works and taken this conversation. I think I was little, um, I was I was listening like a, like in a classroom, and I, I totally enjoyed it. And uh, so did our uh, listeners and um, uh, people who joined us. So um, I mean, it was an intimate group, and we did get some questions. And I, I'll if you have five more minutes, we'll take uh, two more questions, maybe. Uh, somebody, uh, Dipti Khera, would like to know about your new work, Hell, uh, or the one, um, is if there is a work called Hell. It's, uh, uh, the, we already discussed it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there is another by, uh, there's a comment by uh, Shaisa Shais Thapar about your work, Watercolor. She, she says that uh, they speak volumes and fabulously executed. And uh, there is one by Nidhi Bansal from Facebook. And uh, she says that she's quite intrigued. The kind of details and ideas behind each painting, particularly the last three, uh, I think uh, from the details, uh, what sizes are those? She's asking about the sizes, especially the one which had a painted middle screen, which is about the Edward Monk's uh, screen and staircase and monks. That's the screen, Mala. She's just curious to know the size. I think um, since this is available on YouTube, right? Yeah. Because the slides um, are also, uh, the slides uh, have sort of details about the size of the work as well. So roughly, I don't know exactly in inches, but it would be roughly around um, seven feet by nine feet-ish. Hmm. Nice. I mean, I, I can imagine the kind of, how much time do you uh, finish and how visual is your uh, like world? <laughs> because it's so full of visuals and, you know, it seems like you think in elaborate visuals. And how much time do you take in finishing such a work? Um, how long do you take? I've actually never uh, sort of recorded how much time it takes one particular work because I have this tendency of starting uh, two, three works at a particular go because I think sometimes there's so many things which are just going on in my mind that it just helps to sort of lay it out there and sort of say, okay, this one, I'm going to do this, this one, I'm going to do this, this one, I'm going to do this. And um, a lot of reference images are just thrown on the wall because, you know, it's, it's very difficult to sort of contain them in your head or on the screen of your computer. So every time there's something which is relevant to me that comes up, I take a printout and it just goes up on the wall. Yeah, I think what I really found resonance is with the time and space that plays on the on your canvas mm -hmm. uh, or on your fabric. It's so beautiful because it's a lot of things are happening. And uh, for example, this woman singing uh, a raga in, and the boat rowing. I mean, that kind of um, imagination is beautiful. I think with that, we can call it a day. Uh, thank you, uh, Zina. I think your questions were so important. And I think I was following um, the questions that I had in mind were so well articulated by you. And I think we all um, kind of had a good understanding of Arunika's work through your uh, execution and moderation. Uh, thank you, Varunika, again. I mean, it, it was, uh, it's, um, it's great to have you and uh, hopefully when you, uh, we will like to invite you again sometime and Zenith as well, whenever she's back in India. Okay, uh, I'd love to thank our uh, listeners and people who raised questions and uh, comments about this conversation. We would love to have you back again with another session sometime soon, uh, next month or uh, uh, looking forward. Um, thank you all. Have a great evening and have a great day, Zina. Thank you for taking time out. 
and uh, okay signing out bye guys yeah.